Welcome back YouTube. This is Elonzo Davis with Christ in All Ministry. And today we are going to discuss grace. And so the topic of today's video is grace because as I was reading out of Luke chapter 17, the apostles make a request to Jesus saying, increase our faith. And Jesus' response to that was, if you had faith as a mustard seed, you would say. And so I wanted to get to the bottom of why he didn't just say, here, here it is. Here's more faith. And so it would seem as we read out of the gospels, as we read what Jesus had did, that to ask him to increase your faith is not a request that we ought to be making. And so as I began to study, what I found out is when people are asking or people are feeling like they need more faith, well, the Bible says out of Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, All right? And so what people ought to be asking is, Lord, give me more faith grace because in order to get faith all you need to do is get more of the word and we have that this is my bible we have the word right here so you can find out what the word says about your situation and there there's your faith right there faith is not a matter of uh size faith is more so like quantity when jesus says that the centurion had great faith the word great there means great in number and so it's not about how big it is. It's about simply just having it because he doesn't say have faith the size of a mustard seed. And I'll teach more about this in a separate video about how faith is, how faith operates or what faith is and how faith operates. I'll teach about that deeper in another video. But when Jesus says that the centurion has great faith, it's talking about quantity there, the word great. It wasn't about size, you know. And so what we see there is when he says to have faith as a mustard seed, not, not to say faith the size of a mustard seed, because then he would be contradicting himself when he rebukes all these people out of the gospel when we read it for having little faith. But why does he say have faith as a mustard seed or like a mustard seed? He says that because what you do with a seed, no matter how small it is, is you plant it in the ground and then it produces something. And so how our faith operates is once you have it, you plant it or you you put it into operation, you exercise it. And then what happens is faith produces. And so when Jesus is responding to the disciples' request to increase their faith, I would say, let's say if I was there, what we ought to be asking for is more grace. And so I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter four, and we're going to read why we need to be asking the Lord for more grace. In this video, we're going to discuss what grace is. We're going to discuss where grace comes from and also how to get grace. So stay tuned. Thank you for watching. So again, let's turn to Acts chapter four. Let's have that ready because before we start reading the scripture for where we're getting the word grace from, I need to define grace as we see it in this text. So keep Acts chapter four ready. And we're gonna be looking at verse, you know, this is actually a really good story. We're gonna read all of it up to verse 33. So we'll just start at verse one. But what is grace? So out of Acts chapter four, verse 33, we see the word grace there. And it is this Greek word in the uh, original language, charis or charis, however you really want to pronounce it. But it's C-H-A-R-I-S. And so when we're looking at the uh, context of this word grace, uh, what we can see in the definition is that it's, a, it's the divine influence of God upon one's heart and so it's favor, it's acceptable, it's a benefit, it brings joy, it has to do with liberality and pleasure, even worthiness. And um, I like this definition it shares here, where it says that it's kind of like goodwill, loving kindness, and favor all wrapped in the one. And it says it's of the merciful kindness by which God exerting his holy influence upon souls, turns them to Christ keeps them, strengthens them, and increases them in Christian faith, knowledge, affection, and kindles them to the exercise of Christian virtues. So if you were to listen to a minister speak on grace, what they would define it as widely is really power. And so I like um, this definition 
here where it says that grace is the power to do the will of God. Grace is the influence of God on a person's life. It's the presence of God's power on someone's life to will and to do his good pleasures. And so let's keep this in mind as we read Acts chapter 4, starting from the beginning. I'm reading out the KJV. It says, And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus and the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now even time. And so what happened was uh, there was a lame man at a gate called Beautiful. Peter and John healed him. He's going around rejoicing, praising the Lord. And so the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and this Jewish council of um, students of the law kind of do what we just read. They did to Peter and John. And so verse five, it says, and it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas, the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of high priests were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, look there, said unto them, you rulers of the people and elders of Israel. If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom, excuse me, whom you crucified, who God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone. Ooh. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Hallelujah. Now, this is Peter, y'all. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside of the council, Go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For they indeed a notable that is exactly how it reads. For that in no, for that indeed a notable miracle have been done by them and is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. That was verse 16. My goodness. Verse 17. But that is spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge yourself. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chiefs and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is that is in them, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against the holy child Jesus, who thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. By stretching forth your hand to heal, hallelujah, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Verse 33, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Great grace 
was upon them all after they prayed for more boldness to speak God's word and for God to work with them by stretching forth his hand to heal and to bring about signs and wonders as they taught and preached in the name of the Lord Jesus. Even after their leaders, the apostles were persecuted and threatened by the Jewish council of Pharisees, Sadducees, right? Because they went about teaching and healed a man in the name of Jesus and the people were glorifying God in Christ. Look at this. And so this is what the disciples asked for. They asked for boldness and God granted them this, right? He gave them boldness because the disciples were operating in great grace. And so we need to ask God for grace. And I'm going to tell you why after you turn with me to Romans chapter four, and let's look at verse 16. I need to explain something they will understand why we need to ask for grace. And then we'll move on to where grace comes from. And so, um, man, grace is so important. We're going to Romans chapter four, we're gonna look at verse 16. And grace is so important because uh, I like something that I heard my pastor quote in service this week. He said that grace is like a ticket on a train. It's your pass to basically go. And uh, when he said that, my mind started to you know, add a little bit to it because I knew what he was saying. It's really like grace is your pass from God to do something with ease that would otherwise be overwhelming in the natural. And so using the train ticket, for example, right? You're getting from point A to point B. Let's say the distance between those two points is like a hundred kilometers. All right. I don't know why I said kilometers, but think of that, right? That's longer than a mile. And so is it? Anyway, this is in a math class. So look, there's a difference between walking from point A and walking to point B, as in riding a train between point A and point B. One is going to be easier than the other. And so grace is your ticket to go through the course of actions that makes this challenge easier for you. Grace makes things easier easy that will otherwise be overwhelming in the natural and here's why romans 4 16 it says that therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed not to that only which is of the law but to that also which is of the faith of abraham who is the father of us all and so let's read that uh former part this is the answer or well, this is what I want to expound upon. It says, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end, the promise might be sure. So what are we saying there? It's the same setup as Ephesians chapter two, verse eight, that we are saved by grace through faith. And so grace and faith are two components that equate to the promise of God. Salvation is a promise of the Lord. Excuse me. And that promise comes to be sure to us believers in Christ because of God's grace and our faith. Now, so if you to look at that as like a math equation, right? It's promises equal grace times faith. And we know faith is the word and works, right? Or actions. Some people don't like the word works. Because, you know, the whole works-based salvation type of thing. So they don't want to use the word works there. And so the elements of faith are, or really is just acting on the word of God. And so acting on the word of God amplifies God's grace to bring about his promises. How does faith come? By the word, by hearing, preaching to you, absorbing all of that into your spirit, into your um, heart, to your mind. And then you act on it and you're acting on his word, then amplifies his grace that's constantly there, that's constantly available. The Bible says faithful is he that promised. And once those two things mix, then comes about the promises of God. And so in asking for more grace, what we are truly doing is asking for more access to the power of God. And so... Before we expound on that, let's 
look at where does grace come from? Because obviously it's God's grace, but there's actually a Bible verse for this. And it says in John chapter one, verse 17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And so where does grace come from? It comes from Jesus Christ, who is also the word of God, who is also the son of God, right? And so if you want grace, first you need to get Christ, right? That's what we're reading out of John chapter 1, verse 17. And this, um, this verse here made me think about something. Because in our definition of what grace is, it's the presence of God's power in one's life to will and to do his good pleasures. And so grace is something that we, that we need to grow in because the word great in front of grace out of Acts chapter 4, verse 33 has to deal with mass and strength. And so your grace can grow in strength. Your grace can grow in mass. It's something that um, God gives us once we receive Jesus Christ. And so the more grace you have or the greater your grace is, the more power you have to operate in order to do the will of God and not just do it, but be successful in completing it and accomplishing what we're supposed to accomplish for him as a body and personally for whatever it is that your cross is to bear. And I remember sitting in a service, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to something like this, where there's somebody who's teaching or they're preaching and they're saying the word of God, they're reading the scripture, uh, they might even add some extra biblical information there or something outside of the word to kind of just um, add to their um, expounding of the word. However, as you're sitting there listening to this person, there is no power on their words. And there's no power because we come to see that there is an absence of grace. That's 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 what's that's why there's no power because there's an absence of grace. There's an absence of of God's influence for them to be able to do what what they're doing, preaching the word or teaching the word with ease. And so you're kind of sitting there and it's bland. The person's boring. You don't want to listen to them. And then there's no demonstration of the things that they are saying. And that's because of this right here. Grace gives you access to power. Notice this. The disciples asked for more boldness to go and do what Jesus had already told them to do. They even get filled with the Holy Spirit again, even the ones that might have been there and they had not yet gotten filled with the Holy Spirit yet. But we have to go back to um, Acts chapter 1, where Jesus lets them know to wait in Jerusalem until you have received power. Now, at this point, the disciples had already received the Great Commission. They've already done and worked miracles with their own hands by the permission of Christ as they were sitting as his disciples while he was yet in the land of the living. But when he left, what he told them to do before they went to go fulfill the task that they were already aware of, to go and make disciples, to go and teach people all the things that he had taught them, he said to wait for power. Why is that? Because if you're going to be successful in doing the work of the Lord, the Bible says in Philippians 2.13, it is God who works in you to will and to do his good pleasures. Before you get to that point to actually do, you need power. And that power comes by God's grace. It gives you access to this promise of power. And so God's power equals his grace being amplified by our faith. So as we put our faith in his word. We act upon it. God's grace is there to then produce power. And so a lot of people skip over the step of receiving power because they are outside of faith. And so I'll teach, again, I'll teach more deeply on what faith is and how faith operates. But just to kind of give an overview, faith has many major components, but it's really like a cycle triangle. And so picture this. This is obedience, this is love, and this is faith, right? And so the Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's the element of, it's, just a, it's a spiritual thing of, about belief that pleases God and causes him to do for you. And it says in Galatians 5 and 6, at the end of that verse, that faith 
works by love, right? And then it says out of John 14 and 21 that our love is proven by our obedience, right? So when we receive the word of God, what happens is, let's start up here. You begin to obey the word of God if you believe it, right? So that's the faith part. So faith comes by hearing. And then faith comes alive when you start to obey or to act on God's word. And then your acting proves, your obedience to his word proves that you love God. And then what happens is your faith starts to work. So it's alive at the point of when you act on it, but it doesn't start to work, right? Until your love is proven by your acting. So this is the life cycle of faith. And what we see in many people's lives is that when they, when they hear the word of God, right? That's in this realm of faith. They don't act on things because they don't, they're taught or they just don't believe things or they let their experiences dictate what God's will and command is. And then now what happens is they're not in obedience, which then makes it so that they are not in love. And if you're not in love, you can't be in faith. The Bible says that you do good to believe. Even the demons believe, but are the demons a part of the faith? Paul says that we ought to examine ourselves to see if we are even in the faith. And so a lot of these ministers, I don't want to say like that. And so we see that ministers, right? I'm not going to say a lot. I don't know how many ministers are out there. But we see that ministers lack power on their life. They lack power in their ministries, which means that they are lacking in grace because their faith is off somewhere. And so where does grace come from? Well, it comes from Christ, but we have to understand how to receive grace. And so when we look at Acts chapter 4, what we saw was that the apostles were getting persecuted. They had got pulled aside. They got pulled into this council of religious, um, you know, hypocrites. And they said, stop teaching in the name of Jesus. You guys did this miracle in his name. We don't want y'all doing all of that. They still hate Christ, right? These men that have no formal training are, are continuing the works of Christ. And they can perceive because of how boldly they are speaking already, right? That these men have been with Jesus. And so once Peter and John, they go back to their... Uh, to their congregation, they go back to their company. It says that they begin to pray, Lord, give us more boldness so that we can continue even in the midst of the persecution. The more they were oppressed, the more they began to operate with power. And that's indicative of, a, I believe it's written somewhere in Exodus chapter one, where it says that the more that the Israelites were oppressed, the more that they, actually, let me read it to you. And so even in the New Testament, the New Testament church, we see that the more that these people were pressed, the harder they went for God. And so why is that? Because it's just as it says in Exodus chapter one. Is it verse 12? Yes, it says that, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And so even in the midst of all this affliction, all this tribulation and all these trials, the disciples said, we need to keep going. We need to keep pressing. We have a great work to do. And because of their willingness, because they pray, because they ask the God, because they lean on the Lord for more power, great grace was upon them all. And so if grace comes from Jesus Christ, we get more of it by having a heart that is willing to suffer to advance the kingdom of God, by having this understanding that we need to be in communication or prayer with the Lord, copying what we see the disciples do here in Acts chapter four, we have to be willing to, to, to minister to, and minister to the point where God is stretching forth his hand to heal and signs and wonders are happening. We have great grace because we need great power in order to do these things. And so God granted that unto them. As they said, we will be bold for you. Give us the boldness and we will operate in it. And in turn, God said, okay, I'm going to put great grace on your life because as you operate boldly for me, my hand is going to be stretched forth the hill. Signs and wonders are going to follow the things that you preach and teach about me. And so um, jumping to a conclusion, we see out of Hebrews 4, that we can actually ask for grace. 
So it's not faith that we need to ask for. It's faith that we get in, in number by believing on the word of God. And so why is that? It's because you can put your faith in many things. Because faith works by acting on God's principles. There are many principles that we see have specific actions to them that when we do these specific actions, they yield a specific promise from God. And so the more you know about the Lord, the more you know that God demands from you. And then the more you know that once you do what God demands from you, the promises that God is willing to grant you for doing that specific demand. And so that's kind of how faith operates. And so we see why when Jesus says that the centurion has great faith, the number, or not the number, but the word for grace there has to do with quantity. And so, but when it comes to having great grace, the strength, the mass, the size of it, right? This is what it says out of Hebrews 4.16. It says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The disciples were in a time of need. They were suffering great persecution even then at the beginning of this New Testament church. These are the guys that started it all. These are the forerunners. These are the trailblazers, right? They're establishing what has come to be what we see today. These are the guys that established it. They made it start to run after Jesus went away. These are the apostles, right? And so God gave them great grace so that power would come from their faith in him. And I would say, if they needed great grace then, how much more do we need great grace now? Do you know that Paul actually encouraged his son in the faith, Timothy, by saying that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Now, this is written after Acts chapter 2, where we see that the last days began because the Bible prophesies that in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And in Acts chapter 2, that is the fulfillment of that prophecy from Job. And so we've gotten to the day. 2000 and some years later, right? They needed great grace then. How much more do we need great grace now as we are living in a day where it is openly evil? It's openly demonic, right? And so it's it's open, but in this day, it's more so hidden. Back in the days of um, when the Israelites were walking around in the wilderness, I mean, they knew curses worked. They knew how to put curses on people. They knew how the demonic power operated. And nobody was surprised or it wasn't hidden from the eyes of these people. But today it is so well hidden from non-believers. And so we need great grace so that it's not only this negative demonic power that is in operation today that is so well hidden from the from uh, basically the world, but we need to have God's virtuous power. We need to have great grace so that we can have great virtuous power from the Lord so that signs and wonders can happen, proving to these people that the faith that we have in the resurrected Christ is real. And so the writer of Hebrews says that we need to come to God's throne of grace so that we may find, mer obtain mercy and find grace. There is more grace to be found when we go to the throne. And we can go boldly to the throne, seeing that he is our father and he's granted us access to him. And we know what we need more grace for, because if we read the Bible, we know what we are supposed to have faith in. And so, like, let's say something practical about this, right? Is uh, nowhere in the New Testament, except for one place in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I believe. Nobody ever prays a prayer addressing God to handle a demon for them. The only person to do that is Paul. And you know what he says about that? He says, God answers him and says, my grace is sufficient and my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Right. And so Paul didn't say, Lord, give me more faith. He asked God, just remove this thing from me. Remove this thorn in the flesh from me. And God says, no, no, no. I've given you grace. We know that Paul's faith wasn't something to scoff at, right? And so what does God encourage Paul, who is so faithful? He, he encourages Paul by saying, I've given you grace. My grace on your life makes my strength perfect in your weakness. And so when we are feeling weak, what we need to do is ask God for more grace because his strength that comes from this grace perfects our weaknesses. It perfects us in our weakness. So when we have this brother or this sister sh sh 
struggling with lust, it's not that you need more faith. It's you need to ask God to give you the grace, give you the power to overcome, give you the power to fulfill who you are supposed to be, to give you the power to live as your identity states in Christ. He's literally just saying, Lord, give me the grace to overcome this trial. Give me the grace to overcome this temptation. Or Lord, give me the bonus to, to profess my faith. Give me the bonus to stand for you, right? It's, you believe that these are the things you ought to do. That's why you want to do them. So it's not a problem with you having faith. You just don't have the grace to, to act on this faith. Or I'll say like this. You just don't have the grace or the power, the boldness to openly act on the faith that you are believing in. And so it's not an issue of faith because faith comes by hearing the word, right? But there's a power, there's a boldness that you need to do in order to act on that faith. And there you can ask God to give you grace. And I love what it says out of James chapter one, uh, speaking about wisdom there, but it says that if you need wisdom, ask God and he gives it liberally and without rebuke. He's not going to rebuke you for asking him for something. He actually wants you to come to him and ask him for things. And so I, I truly do believe that you can put grace there. If you need grace, come to God's throne, right? We're going to add that to um, Hebrews 4.16. Come to God's throne boldly and ask him for more grace because he's willing to give it to you to help you in your time of need as we see here in Acts chapter 4. And um, again, being in the day that we are in today, the Bible says that where wickedness abounds, where sin abounds, there much more grace abounds. And so what that is telling us is God has given us an answer for every evil operation. And the, lar the larger that evil operation is, the more grace is available to you to overcome it. And so if you feel in your life that there's su such wickedness a situation that you just need to overcome, you have to understand that God promises you that there is more grace for you. And so all of you out there that need more grace, simply ask God for it. He's faithful and just to promise, and he's not going to leave you never or nor forsake you, but you have to understand you need grace. And grace grants you access to the power of God to succeed in what it is you are supposed to do as a child and a citizen of the kingdom. God bless you and keep you. So thank you so much for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, please stay tuned because next week we're going to be releasing a video about faith and how it operates and all the stuff behind that. But in the meantime, I'd like for you to like this video, comment, subscribe, and share it with a friend. Thank you so much. God bless.